We departed Rarotoga and cruised for five days across an area of the South Pacific known as the continent of Oceania and includes Australia, Malaysia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. During this journey, we also crossed the international dateline, gaining one day on the calendar. On day six, we sighted land, arriving at the small New Zealand city of Gisborne. There are several notable facts associated with Gisborne. Because of its location near the Dateline on the eastern shore of New Zealand, it's the first city every day to welcome the sunrise. It was also the first spot in New Zealand to be visited by Captain Cook in 1769 as part of his expeditionary voyage of discovery that circumvented the globe. As Cook's ship, the Endeavour, approached the New Zealand shore, the first person to spot land was Nicholas Young, a 12-year-old surgeon's assistant. In his honor, these cliffs were named Young Nick's Head. As our tender approached the disembarkation platform, we note that the port is small and quiet. The population of Gisborne is just 32,000, and the port reflected that. Tied up to the dock were two Vaka Moana double-masted traditional Polynesian sailing canoes that had traveled from Tahiti. The ocean worthiness of these ships demonstrated the ability of the indigenous people to travel the great distances between the islands. Filling one dock was a great stack of logs awaiting to be exported. We saw these in almost every port we visited and learned that most were shipped to China and other Southeast Asian countries. Strolling the port area, we saw several notable sites. We crossed the Terengani River, which is 1,200 meters long, making it the shortest river in the Southern Hemisphere. On its shore is a cenotaph honoring those who died in the First World War. At the entry to the port is a statue commemorating the visit by Captain Cook. Local artwork included a wall covered with ceramic towel decorated by children, a large Maori sculpture, and a number of small buildings painted to give the impression they were much larger. In general, we were impressed by the well-maintained surroundings, the friendliness of the people, and the relaxed atmosphere. We took a bus tour of the surrounding area, stopping first at the Metahero Winery. It had a rustic old farmhouse look from the outside, but inside it was nicely decorated. The wine, bread, and cheese were excellent. The area is known for its Chardonnay, and we can attest that their Pinot Gris and Merlot were also exceptional. From our host, we learned about how the wine is produced. We saw that poplar trees are used as a windbreak, and netting is attached around the bottom half of the vines to prevent birds from eating the grapes. From there, we rode through the town, which only has two traffic lights, and passed the clock tower, which had been damaged in an earthquake in 1931, but is now an endearing landmark. Soon, we were out of town, where we stopped briefly at one of the many surfing beaches. We are told that the houses on the beach sell for over a million dollars. Our bus made a final stop at a hilltop park that overlooked the city and the bay. We noted a stone monument displaying a plaque that stated that the land for the park had been given by the Maori, who are the indigenous people of New Zealand. This is significant because in 1840, during the early settlement period of New Zealand, the British signed the Treaty of Watangi with the Maori which gave the British sovereignty over New Zealand, but gave the Maori ownership of much of the land and protected them as British subjects. Returning to the port, we saw some attractive, well-maintained homes, but the best indication of the quality of life in Gisborne 
was summarized by this ad painted on the side of one small building. That evening, back on the ship, we had dinner at one of the specialty restaurants. Here are a few photos showing the presentation and quality of the food on the Asmara journey. That night, our ship sailed from Gisborne to the capital city, Wellington. Wellington is on the Cook Strait, which is a passage between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. Two lighthouses announce the entrance to the strait. The winds from the west are funneled between the islands, making Wellington the windiest city in the world. The water churns with the white caps, and anything that isn't tied down blows away. At the port, we see the 30,000-seat stadium where rugby and soccer games are held and the now familiar inventory of logs awaiting export. Our tour of Wellington begins with a ride through the city and then a steep climb up Mount Victoria to the lookout at the peak, which has the best view of the city and surrounding area. The houses here are built into the side of the mountain. The road is quite steep and winding. Many of the homes have unique architecture and some have their own elevators to allow them to descend from their homes to a garage or street access below. On the top of Mount Victoria, the wind was blowing a gale force, but the view of the city and the surrounding area was spectacular. In addition to the port and the downtown area, we could see Evans Bay and the area of housing that had been occupied by the U.S. Air Force during World War II. The land bridge where the airport is now was created in 1841 when a giant earthquake lifted the land out of the sea to connect the two land masses. At the water's edge near the airport, we see the Wellington sign. This is modeled after the Hollywood sign, with the difference being that the last three letters are being blown away, recognizing Wellington as the world's windiest city. The next stop was the Miramar Complex, where many animated movies, including Lord of the Rings and Avatar, were created. We stopped at the Weta Cave. This was a small museum and souvenir shop with a number of life-size displays of animated movie characters, including Gollum and an ogre. They were all very cooperative for taking photos. We also saw a giant weta bug cast in an acrylic mold. These enormous insects, native to New Zealand, grew up to be four inches long. Our next stop was the Kilbourn Cable Car, which was constructed in 1899 to transport people from the city to the suburb of Kilbourn. It was rebuilt in 1979 and continues to carry passengers 2,060 feet up the side of the mountain through two tunnels. It is a hybrid between a funicular and a cable car. Like a cable car, there is a continuous loop which is gripped by the car and pulls it up the hill. But there is also a funicular style balancing cable permanently attached to the two cars so that the descending car can help lift the ascending car. We stopped briefly at the Lady Norwood Rose Garden, which included a begonia house that had orchids and bananas and many other varieties of flora in addition to a beautiful collection of begonias. Final stop of the day was a visit to Parliament. The government complex consists of four buildings. The library is the oldest structure built in 1899 in Gothic Revival style. Next to it, built in marble and granite, is the Parliament House, where the Parliament meets. 
to its left is the executive wing known as the Beehive. It contains the Prime Minister's offices. Next to it is the Bowen House, which provides housing for support staff. As I viewed the complex, I was struck by the lack of security personnel. They were either well hidden or the citizens of this country have far less fear of terrorism and vandalism. On that note, we head back to the ship and prepare to cruise to our next destination, which is Picton.